Father, as we come to you right now, I do want to thank you so much for the time that was invested this week in Bible study. Whether it was reading the text, reading it out loud, looking at some of these key words, just kind of getting in there and getting close to the text, I know that the time spent was profitable and useful. So Father, I pray for our time together tonight. I pray that you would just open the word to us, allow us to see it for what it is. And Father, that you would apply it to our hearts and lives, that we would take it this week and we would be able to live out these truths and even be able to share them with someone else who has a need. For it is in Jesus' name that I pray, amen. Well, let's go then to Colossians chapter 1. And tonight we're going to look at verses 3 through 14. That's our journey tonight, and I believe we can, we can handle this without a whole lot of difficulty. Now, as we looked at last time, we introduced the letter, the epistle, as Paul refers to it in chapter 4. And notice the different items there by way of review. We found his name, Paul. Paul is the author. That is, uh, except for some of the most liberal theologians around today, everybody agrees that Paul the Apostle was the writer, the author of this book. His ministry, an apostle of Jesus Christ, his calling was by the will of God, his fellow companion in the ministry, his young son, the faith Timothy, one that is very familiar to us, mentioned many times in the Word of God. His recipients were the saints and the faithful brethren in Colossae, and then his blessing of grace and peace. Well, let's read Colossians chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. Let's read all the way down to verse 14. We give thanks to God and to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit, as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. As you also learn from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God." Strengthen with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Well, notice first of all, Paul's praise for the Colossians. Now as he's praying and praising, we see in this section here that he's praising God for these Colossian believers. And notice he says, we give thanks. Paul penned these words down in an attitude of thanksgiving and praise to God. What are you thankful for tonight? I happened onto something in my computer this week. I don't know how long I've had this in there, probably sent to me by a friend years ago. But listen, 12 things I'm thankful for. I'm thankful for the mess to clean up after a party. Thankful for my friends who came. I'm thankful for the taxes I have to pay. Thankful that I am employed. Thankful that for the clothes that fit a little too snug. Thankful that I have enough food to eat. Thankful for a lawn that needs mowing, windows that need cleaning, and gutters that need fixing. Thankful that I have a home. Thankful for all the complaining I hear about our government. Thankful for the freedom of speech. Thankful for the space I find at the far end of the parking lot. Thankful for all the people who attended church today, and I'm capable of walking. Thankful for my huge electric bill. Thankful for heat and air conditioning. 
Thankful for the lady behind me in church who sings off key. Thankful that I can hear. Thankful for the piles of laundry and ironing. Thankful that I have clothes to wear. Thankful for weary and aching muscles at the end of the day. Thankful that I have been able to be productive. And thankful for the alarm that goes off early in the morning hours. Thankful that I'm alive and have a reason to get up. And thankful for getting a lot of email. Thankful I have friends who are thinking of me. Well, what are you thankful for tonight? Paul was thankful for these Colossians. He praised God in an attitude of thanksgiving for these people. People that he had never met. He had never been to Colossae. And yet he was thankful for them. Giving thanks was a customary greeting of Paul. Now, when Paul says, we give thanks... Uh, the theologians like to discuss whether he was using the we as a general sense. You know, sometimes they say we are coming over, and it's just maybe I'm coming over. Uh, but Paul said it, it could have been that it was Paul saying, I give thanks, and Timothy gives thanks, and we give thanks. But he was thankful, and they were thankful to God for these Colossians. Well, notice letter A there, the direction of his praise. The direction of his praise there, verse 3, we give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's always where the praise goes, isn't it? We always send our praise to God. We might be thankful for other people, thankful for friends, thankful for teachers and preachers that, that share the word with us, but our praise always goes to God. Letter B, the continuance of his praise. Notice what he says there, praying always for you. Now, what we have here is, as Paul is in this attitude of thankful praise and thinking about prayer, it was a continual thing. Paul must have prayed for hundreds and thousands of people. Because there are different places in the Bible where he says, I'm always praying for you, I'm always thinking of you. Now, whether he always had them on his prayer list, and every time he prayed, uh, he always thought of these different people, he probably didn't know very many people by name in Colossae. So I'm sure he prayed for hundreds and thousands of people, generally speaking. I mean, you could pray for all the people in California in five minutes. It's pretty general, isn't it? But that doesn't mean that you're praying for every certain specific person in the state of California. But as we pray, and as Paul prayed, these people had such a hold in his heart that when he prayed and as he thought about them, when he praised God for the work as it was going on around the world, he remembered these Colossian people. Notice also, let her see here, the reason for his praise or the reasons for his praise. We're going to give you several reasons here why Paul praised God for these people. Notice what we find here in verse 4. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints. Now what is interesting here and a good question is, how did Paul hear? How did Paul hear about these Colossians uh, giving their lives to Christ? How did he hear about the fact that they had been given, that they had given their lives to Christ and been saved? This would be a good opportunity for us to go back and kind of figure out and see how it was that these Colossians actually gave their lives to Christ. Go back with me to Acts chapter 19. Just hold the place there in Colossians. We're coming right back. Acts 19, as we talked last time, the book of Acts is a, is a neat way, one of the neat ways to study it is to read through the book of Acts and see where it was and where Paul was when he wrote these different letters, these different books. Well, in chapter 19, Paul actually made his way to Ephesus. In fact, if you look at verse 1, Acts 19, 1, it says, And it happened while Paulus was at Corinth, that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples. And so now at Acts 19, Paul is actually in the city of Ephesus, one of the most well-known cities in our Bible. Well, one of the first things that Paul happened onto were some disciples of John the Baptist. And Paul began to inquire about them if they'd received the Holy Spirit. They didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit. Paul shared with them, and so they were genuinely then converted to Christ, received the Holy Spirit, and then continued on. Drop down to verse 8 of that same chapter. 
So after he had this encounter with these disciples of John the Baptist, look at verse 8. And then he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. Even though Paul was called to be an apostle to the Gentiles, being a Jewish man, he always had a heart for his fellow Jewish people. And he went into the synagogues trying his best to teach them the word of God. But notice what happened, verse 9. And when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way, and that's another description for Christians, the way, before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. Still, still in the city of Ephesus, now he's setting up shop in this school. And look at verse 10, a powerful verse, one you might want to star there in your Bible. And this continued for two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Now here's what happened. There in the city of Ephesus, in the school of Tyrannus, he set up shop there as a place. It became a, uh, an evangelistic station, a mission-sending station. And people would come and they would hear the message of the Word of God from the city of Ephesus and from the Apostle Paul. Well, evidently, from all that we can discern from this letter, from material outside of our Bible, here's what happened. Epaphras from Colossae made a journey to Ephesus. Whether he went there to hear the Apostle Paul or he went there just on business, he was there and he heard the gospel message. He heard about how Jesus was the Savior and is the Savior of the world, the Messiah, the long-awaited promised Messiah, and Epaphras gave his life to Christ. He was gloriously saved, and on his journey, he goes back to Colossae. God calls him to preach, and he becomes the church planter in the city of Colossae. And Epaphras, or Epaphras, if you prefer that pronunciation, Epaphras, Epaphras was the guy then who led many of these people to faith in Christ. And now what's happened, there is a heresy that's been developing in the city of Colossae. We'll talk more about that in future studies. But, but Epaphras now is beginning to be concerned about this culture that's rising up in the city of Colossae. He now travels to where Paul is, at the end of the book of Acts, and where is he by then? He's in Rome, in that house arrest situation. And, and it's there that, uh, that, that he gets to be with Paul. Well, Paul then shares with Epaphras, and so, so Paul from Rome, we've now jumped ahead many years, Paul now from Rome writes this letter to the Colossians and says, I praise God that I've heard about how you've given your life to Christ, and he heard it all from Epaphras. Epaphras was the one that came to Paul and shared with him about all these people that had been saved. But yet there's been this heresy that's cropping up in the city, and Epaphras basically saying, I don't know what to do about it. I don't know how to help these folks. And he's arrived to find answers, and Paul now is writing this letter to these believers. So he heard, Paul heard about their faithfulness through the man Epaphras. Notice several things that he is prayerful for and praises God for about these folks. First of all, he praised God for their faith in Christ. Point number one there, their faith in Christ. Look at verse four. Let's go back now to Colossians. He said, I praise God for the faith that you exhibit. Look what he says here. We give thanks to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all the saints. Now there's a lot of different kinds of faith. There's saving faith. There's trusting faith after salvation. There's the active application type of faith where we take the word of God and we apply it to our heart and we trust in it by faith. Paul says, I praise God for your faith. These were faithful people who were walking in the truth and the light of the word of God. Now it's important for us to understand that faith is not just a blind leap in the dark. 
That's how some people think of faith. It's just, it's just believing nothing, just kind of hoping things are all... That's not what faith is. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. In fact, genuine faith is faith that is founded on facts and grounded in evidence and truth. So when we have faith in Jesus Christ, we're not hoping, wringing our hands, just kind of hoping that there is a person out there named Jesus. We, are, we have faith that is solid on foundational truths and facts that He is the Lord and Savior. Paul praised God for their faith. Now it's always important that we have our faith in the right direction. Because it's not faith in faith, it's faith in the right object. Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon tells about a couple of guys who were out on the rapids and their boat capsized. They turned over and they were floating downstream pretty rapidly, actually heading for a waterfall. And some guys on shore threw a rope to help these guys get to safety. One guy grabbed the rope. Another guy just waved thank you because he had grabbed onto a log and thought he would be all right. Spurgeon said they both had faith. One guy put his faith in the wrong object and was never seen of again. Well, it's important that we have the right object of our faith. And of course, Jesus Christ, the Lord God, is the object of our faith. Secondly, he praised God and he was thankful for their love for the saints. Point two there, their love for the saints. This word love is a familiar word to us. It's agape. It's that sacrificial kind of love. When we love somebody with agape, it is a sacrificing kind of love. You love your wife, men, with an agape love. Not just a phileo love, not just because you're fellow human beings, but because you deeply love her. You would sacrifice your life for her if need be. Well, Paul said that was the kind of love that they had for the fellow saints. It was also a non-selective love. Paul says they had a love for all of the saints. So they had a genuine kind of love. Point three there, Paul praised God for their promised inheritance. Look at verse five. Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Paul was praising God and thanking God because of the promised inheritance that was theirs. We're saved tonight, genuinely saved. But there's also out there prepared for us the full salvation, the full experience of salvation, where one day this faith is going to be sight. One day we're going to experience the Lord personally, actually be able to be there with Him. And that, that inheritance is something that's laid up for us in the future. When I think about the promised inheritance, I think of a passage of Scripture. It's one of my favorites in the Bible. Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. I've shared this uh, more times than I can even count in memorial services and helping a family who's just distraught over the loss of a loved one, saved but yet separated and, and not able to be, to be with them in communication. Look what the Apostle Peter says here. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, powerful words. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. Paul said our salvation is so secure, it is being kept by the power of God. There is no other power. There is no higher power than God. God is the one that has our salvation in his hands, in his heart, in his grasp. And when Paul talked about the hope that was laid up for these Colossians, he was thinking about that full appearance of salvation where everything is going to be fresh and new, even 
even the newness of our body, we're going to have a spiritual body. Paul was looking forward to that. When Pat and I went to our second church in northeast Tennessee, a senior adult couple in that church adopted us, Claude and Hazel Tester. Claude and Hazel are now with the Lord, and uh, they're just special people. They took us under uh, their wing, and Claude and Hazel loved to garden, and they loved to can, and praise God, they loved to share. <laughs> One time they, uh, they took us down, I, I can't remember if Pat was, I think she was there with me at this time, but took us down in the cellar to let us see all of their canned goods. And I want to tell you, it was a sight to behold. I felt like a kid in a candy store as they were saying, just, just get some things there you might need. Well, when we think about our salvation being laid up in store, we're talking about it being preserved, prepared, ready for us. And so that's what Paul was talking about. He praised God that their salvation was secure. Well, as you look at these last three points, we're talking about faith, hope, and love. These three virtues we find throughout the Word of God, faith, hope, and love. Jot a few verses down. We'll not take the time to actually chase these down, but if you want, just jot down 1 Corinthians 13, 13, where Paul wrote, and now abides faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Jot down Galatians 5, 5 and 6 where he wrote, For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of the righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. Faith, hope, and love. How about 1 Thessalonians 1.3, where Paul wrote about the Thessalonians and their work of faith, their labor of love, and their patience of hope. In Jesus Christ. One more. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate, the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Well, this, this trilogy of faith, hope, and love are key throughout Scripture. We could say that faith looks up looks up to God. Love looks out. It looks out to fellow saints, looks out to the lost because we know that they need to be saved as well. But hope looks to the future for what God has laid up for us and has prepared for us and is preparing for us. Well, we've got to move on. Paul praised God for their promised inheritance. Number four here, he praised God for their reception of the gospel, that they had received the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look what he says here in verse 5. Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel which has come to you. Paul praised God that they received the message of the gospel, that they heard it, that they adopted it, it became theirs. In the context of this, Paul must have also been thinking about the culture in the Colossae and that heresy that I mentioned earlier that was surfacing. And even though they had heard that, they had embraced the message of the gospel. We hear a lot of things. If you listen to talk radio, if you watch any kind of news on television, you hear a lot of things. And you kind of wonder what to believe and what not to believe. Well, Paul praised God that even in the midst of the culture that was trying to co-opt them and trying to get them to believe heresy, he praised God that they had received the truth of the gospel. Jesus said, the word is truth. Now, as they received the truth, they received it from the word of God. The word of God in their day would have been the Old Testament, and they read the word of God. It would have also been this letter to the Colossians. They didn't fully understand how powerful and how significant that letter was. Probably at that time, they probably thought it would just be more than a letter from this apostle. But it became a very part of the Word of God. There was also a letter that we'll come to in chapter 4 called the Letter to the Laodiceans that they also read and studied. We'll find out what that letter was when we get to that point. But Paul praised God for the truth 
of the gospel that they had received. Truth is a, is a key thing in our day. All of us who have watched any television, listened to any radio, or read any kind of fine print know that there are many disclaimers out there. Disclaimers that have to be put out there to cover up the half-truths that are shared in some kind of contract. The fine print must be read very carefully. Very few of us read fine print. I had a uh, minister of children work for me one uh, many years up in Indiana. He was, a, he was an attorney before God called him to preach. He read all of the fine print. When he let, downloaded software, you know, you all get that software and you have all that fine print which nobody reads, he would read it. Well, that was, the, but we have to do that sometimes because truth is such a strange thing. In our day, people say one thing and mean another. But in Paul's day, truth had a, had a unique object. In Paul's day, they didn't have the luxury of the instant replay. They didn't have the luxury of the photo finish like they had to have sometime in the Olympics. They had to have somebody that they knew who was trustworthy, who stood at the finish line and would be willing to declare the winner even if the winner was not the person he wanted to win. That was a truthful person. Paul talked about, how, about the truth of the gospel, these true and faithful brethren he was talking about. Well, number five, we've got to move on. Paul also thanked God, praised God for the messengers who preached, for the messengers who shared the word of God. Look at verse 6. Which has come to you as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. The messengers of the gospel. Well, some of these messengers obviously would have been God the Father. He's a messenger. He's the very designer of salvation, the plan of salvation. A messenger would be Jesus Christ. He's the perfect sacrifice for our salvation. The Holy Spirit would be a messenger. The Holy Spirit's the one that convicts us and leads us to an understanding we need to be saved. But certainly he was including Epaphras and fellow preachers that were sharing the Word of God with them. Number six, also included here, the fruit they produced. Paul praised God that they were growing, they were developing, and the fruit was bearing evidence that they were genuinely children of God, genuinely Christians. Jesus said, you shall know them by their fruit. And so the way in which that we can tell when a person is a genuine believer is by the fruit. Now we think about fruit as it develops, and if we compare a piece of fruit to the spiritual life, we could say that there is that work that's on the inside that only God can see, and then there's that work on the outside which others can see. In the spiritual life, there is that work on the inside that sometimes we can't see, only God can see, but sometimes we feel that we are developing. But it's that fruit on the outside, that growth on the outside that others can see. Sometimes we feel like we're not growing. Sometimes we feel like our growth is negative, that we're backing up. But what a blessing it is when somebody comes to you and, and, and there, there's something about your, your countenance or something about the way you carry yourself that they say something. They may not say, I recognize you're a Christian, but they say something to indicate that they recognize you're different. Paul praised God that these Colossians were bearing fruit. They were growing on the inside, which only God could see and they could sometimes feel. But they were also growing on the outside and others could see. And were, they were bearing fruit all over the world. Well, he talked about the hearing of the gospel. Let's read this again. Because of the hope which is, verse 5, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before. Let's focus on that idea of hearing. The, you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. That word there, heard, speaks of a point in time. There's a point in time for each of you that are saved tonight. There's a point in time when you heard the gospel 
clearly like you had never heard it before. I know when that point in time was for me, and you probably know when it was for you. You may have heard a hundred sermons, maybe more. Maybe a thousand times you saw on, on bridge overpasses, Jesus saves as you were on vacation. Well, there's a place up there in Ohio where we, Pat, Pat and I traveled and we would go up there to see our son. There's a big old sign that says, hell is real. Well, yeah, that's true. And we see those signs. But there's a point in time where this message of the gospel bears fruit and we see it. The reality of the gospel is seen by us in our heart like we've never seen it before. We recognize it is the truth of the gospel. We understand that Jesus Christ would save us, could save us, if we put our faith in him, and we do it. We commit our lives to him. We confess him as Lord and Savior, and we are saved at that moment. That's what he's talking about, the moment they heard the truth of the gospel. And I hope and trust and believe that everybody here tonight, you've heard the gospel at that level. That you've been saved and you know it and there's no doubt about it. We're on shouting ground right there. When we think about how, I mean, we were dead men walking. I, I saw that movie a while back by that very title. And I would tell you that, that describes what we were before we gave our lives to Christ. Paul said we were dead in our trespasses and sin, Ephesians chapter 2. Walking around in the course of this world, and yet spiritually dead. But there came that moment in time where the light of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ bore its way into our heart, and we've never been the same. Praise God for His amazing grace. Well, we've got to move on. Another thing we see here is the faithfulness of Epaphras. Point number seven, the faithfulness of Epaphras. They had heard the truth. That truth was bearing fruit. But Paul praised God for this man by the name of Epaphras. Look at verses seven and eight. As you also learn from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. Paul praised God for Epaphras. He loved Epaphras. I, I think there's, there's going to be a slide here. I think I include that in the, in the set here. How Epaphras, he taught them. He was a fellow servant. He was a faithful minister. He testified to Paul about the faithfulness of these Colossians. And it was Paul who said of Epaphras, he's a fellow servant a fellow bond servant. Paul praised God for this man by the name of Epaphras. Epaphras, as we share, was this man who came to Colossae, excuse me, came to Ephesus from Colossae, heard the message of truth, was saved, and now was probably personally responsible, humanly speaking, in leading many of these Colossians to faith in Christ. I want to encourage you to do a little project this week. Hopefully it won't take you too long. But every one of us has an Epaphras in our life. That Epaphras might even be a, it might be a, a Miss Epaphras. That person that God used to bring the light of the truth of the gospel clear to your heart. Now that Epaphras in your life could be already gone with the Lord. Maybe he's still alive or she's still alive. Here's what I want to ask you to do. If that person is alive today, I want to ask you to, uh, if you have any idea where they are, I want to ask you to get a little card and just send them a note and say thanks for being my Epaphras. Put Colossians chapter 1, verse 7 and 8 as the reference. Many times, people who have shared the faith for months and years, decades, they have no idea the impact that they've made on other people. Have no idea. And I want to tell you, a note from you, an email, or just a little card from them to say, thanks for being my Epaphras. Thanks for sharing 
the truth of the gospel to me in such a way that I was able to give my life to Christ. If you'd do that, that would be gold in that person's hand. Now, if that person has already gone and be with the Lord, you might send it to their spouse, send it to their children, maybe share it in Sunday school next week. If you can't think of anybody else to send it to, send it to me, and let me just read it for you, just so you have somebody to hear your story. Praise God for the Epaphrases in our life. And right now, as we make a transition from this point to our next one, I want to stop and pray. I want to pray for the Epaphras in your life. And if, as I pray, and as Paul prays God for this Epaphras in Colossae, if as I'm praying an Epaphras comes to mind, there's probably, for most of us, there's probably several people that were significant. And as I'm praying, I want you to have complete liberty and freedom to open your eyes, take your pencil or your pen, jot their name down while you're thinking of them, and then try your best to contact them this week by a card, by an email. Just let them know how much you appreciate their impact. Let's pray. Father, at this uh, juncture in our study, I praise you for the opportunity that we have to study this marvelous little book. But Father, I do thank you so much for all those people, the men and women that would fit in this category of being our Epaphras. Faithful people who not only went and heard the message of the truth of the gospel and were genuinely saved, but they shared that truth. Shared it in such a way that we had the opportunity to be saved. That Epaphras might be a, a pastor, a Sunday school teacher, a deacon, a mom, a dad. Could even be one of our own children that shared the faith with us. Father, whoever that is, I pray. I just, I just thank you for those folks. And if they're alive, I, I pray, Father, you would give our folks the, the ability to be able to find them and just say thanks. In a brief word, thanks for being my Epaphras. But Father, if they had gone on, they're never with you. Father, if it would be appropriate tonight, we would just ask you to say to them, thanks. Thanks for being strong in the faith. Thanks for being faithful. Thanks for sharing the truth with us. For it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Well, let's move on. Paul not only praised God, but the second thing we see here is Paul's prayer for the Colossians. Now, a couple times in this first section we had the word prayer, but the whole idea in this first section seems to me as that Paul was in an attitude of prayer-filled praise as he was thanking God for these people. But now he's actually talking about praying for them. And so in 9 through 14, we're talking about the, Paul's prayer for the Colossians. Look at verse 9. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. First of all, notice the continuance of his prayer. Again, Paul continued to pray. He prayed often for people, some by name, some by, by region, some by area. But he continued to pray for them. Notice, secondly, the specifics of his prayer. Several things I see here in the specifics of the prayer, there again in verse 9. First of all, he prayed that they would be filled. Look what he says there. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled. And notice, filled with what? Filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now this idea of being filled, if you'll pardon the pun, is filled with meaning. In the Bible, this word filled means not just to be full of food, like we get sometimes, but it means to be controlled by something, to be totally controlled by something in a way that you're filled with it. Let me share with you a few references here if you want to jot these down. In John 16, 6, it talks about the disciples being filled with sorrow. When you're filled with sorrow, it grips your heart like that. In Luke 5, 26, 
people were filled with fear. I hope you've never experienced that, but chances are some of us have. Luke 6, 11, the Pharisees were filled with rage toward Jesus because he healed a man on the Sabbath. And then, of course, there is that being filled with the Spirit, Ephesians 5, 18. Now, Paul wanted these Colossians to be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And I want you to see here, it wasn't he just wanted them to have knowledge. A lot of us have knowledge in certain areas. He wanted them to be filled with knowledge. He wanted the knowledge of the will of God to so be in their spirit and so be in their life that it affected them, it controlled them, it led them to be a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. To have knowledge is, is only of a little value. But for that knowledge to then grip your life and lead you and lead you into understanding and lead you into freedom is power. And that's what Paul prayed for, for these people, that they would be filled with the knowledge of God. Filled with knowledge of God means knowing God's will, following God's will, doing God's will. Sometimes we simply want more information. I'm a guy like that. To be honest, I, I'm one of those guys, I'm always on the edge of seeing what, what else does God want to teach me? What else, God, what else do you want me to learn? What else do you want me to know? I feel like I've been so behind trying to catch up in my Christian life. I'm always out there grasping for the next thing that God wants me to know. Paul said it's not, it's not just to have more knowledge. It's to have the knowledge to be filled, to be controlled with the knowledge of the will of God, so much so that it orders your life. That's what he prayed for, for the Colossian believers. The powerful truth of knowing and following the will of God. Well, as we move on here, let's see what else. We've got to pick up the pace here. Notice point number two here. He also prayed that they would walk worthy. I tell you, this verse really gripped me this week. In fact, I just kind of claimed it as my verse for this week. Look what it says here in verse 10. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Well, I saw that this week. I thought, if I could just live that verse, just that one verse, how amazing life would be that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Now, the word worthy here, it's talking about walking worthy of the Lord, uh, a lot of us, when we think about a scale, we think about, in our day, it's a digital scale. We step on it, and it has a bunch of numbers. And it tells us how much we weigh. We don't like what it says, but it tells us what we weigh. But, of course, many, many years ago, and, and a lot of us remember this, uh, a, a scale was, was, was this kind of deal. And you, I remember as a kid going down to the store with my dad, and he would buy uh, seed corn or beans, and we are going to take it home and plant it. And they would, they would take it to the scale, and of course, if you're going to buy, let's say, about three pounds of corn, they put a three-pound weight over here, and there would be this little cup. And, and then, the, then the lady that was weighing out the corn, she'd start pouring this corn, in the, and, and then as, as, as more and more corn got in the cup, then the balance was, was even. You with me? That's the idea of being worthy. Our walk worthy of the Lord. Not like this, where, where he is... He is, we're so far away from him and we're so down here and certainly not here where we feel like we're, we're, we've just made it. You know, we've got it all figured. It's walking worthy of the Lord. That's, that's what he's talking about. Balance, that our, that our practice, that I put it this way, our, our knowledge of the will of God is equal to our practice. As we used to hear people say, that our talk matches our walk. Uh, that's the idea. Paul says, I wanna, I'm, my prayer is, and, and my praise is, that you're walking worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him. 
He's talking about how they're growing in their spiritual life, and he prays God for their work. Now, this idea, let's read on here. For this reason, since we also... And let me drop down to verse 10, that's where we are. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work. Here again, talking about their spiritual growth, being fruitful and developing. I read this, word this week, J.B. Lightfoot said this about increasing in the knowledge of God and being fruitful. Knowledge of God is the dew or the rain which nurtures the growth of the plant. Knowledge of God is the dew or the rain which nurtures the growth of the plant. Now here's, here's what the Spirit said to me about that. In those days when you feel barren and dry on the inside, and we've all been there, and we'll be there again, it's in those days when we need to increase in the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God is the dew or the rain which nurtures the growth of the plant. So the next time that you feel dry and barren inside and you just feel like you're shriveling up on the inside, you need rain. You need the water of the Word of God. You need to increase in the knowledge of God. Now the difficulty with that is, that's the time when we least feel like doing it. When we're dry and barren, that's the, that's the time we don't feel like reading our Bible, we don't feel like praying, we don't feel like getting out our, our daily bread or whatever and reading a devotional. But that's the day that we need it. And we need to increase in the knowledge of God. God is so big, there's so much about God that we need to learn about Him. We're going to learn about Him more and more as we travel through this book. But in those days of barrenness, rather than just shriveling up and just kind of turning into yourself and maybe having a pity party or just, just kind of woe is me, Paul would say the dew or the rain that will get you out of that barrenness is to increase in the knowledge of God. Well, Let's fine-tune that just a bit. Increasing in the knowledge of God is knowing more and more about God the Father. Now let me add this. In a group our size, there's somebody in here you didn't even know your earthly father. Or the relationship that you had with your earthly father was not a good one or not a very good one. Let me share with you that if that's true for you, then that's going to affect the way you view your Heavenly Father. The way we look at our earthly dads is a lot of times the way we look at our Heavenly Father. And what we need to do, especially if we've experienced that kind of a situation, we need to increase in the knowledge of the will of God and the Word of God and the ways of God according to the Word. We need to read His book, Read this book, and so we understand the truth of the knowledge of God. Paul praised God that they were bearing fruit in that area. Letter three, or number three here, Paul desired that they would be strong spiritually. Look at verse 11. As they strengthened in knowledge of God, he also prayed that they would be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long-suffering with joy. Paul wanted these Colossians to be strengthened with might. Now, the idea of being strengthened there with might, the little word might there is the word dunamis, where we get our word dynamite. Now, we think of dynamite, I, I think of dynamite, I think of destruction. You light that fuse, you throw it in some place, something you want to blow up, and it's destruction. I, I rode on a bus one time with a guy from Evansville, Indiana, Louisville, Kentucky, two-hour trip, and he was the chief, whatever you call him, explosion expert on, the, on that highway that we were driving. And every, and every time we would come to one of these places where they, you know, they dynamite that rock out of the way, I got the full story of how, how you lay that. In some sense, it was a long trip. 
and other ways it was kind of short. But he told me about, here we're, here we're coming up on another, and every time we get to another place, he'd tell me all about. We think about dynamite and its destructive power, but what, what Paul's talking about is the power that is resident in a small package. That's what he's talking about. We may feel small compared to the big forces that are out there kind of beating us down. But Paul said we have the strength of God. Paul prayed that they would be strengthened with might, as he says here, according to his glorious power for all patience and long-suffering with joy. He didn't want them to be beaten down by the culture of Colossae. He wanted them to draw strength from the power of God. We think about the power of God. Paul's talking about not being, strength, not being strong in our own strength, but in the strength of God. But think about the power of God for a minute. I don't know what you think about when you think about God's power. I've written down four things here. First of all, I think of angels. Angels, powerful. One angel, more powerful than a whole brigade of soldiers. But yet it's our God that gives them their power. He's more powerful than they. How about the power to raise the dead? You talk about power. Whether it was Lazarus, the widow's son of Nain, Jairus' daughter, think about the power that it takes to raise someone from the dead. Paul said, I want you to be strengthened with the power of God. There's also the power to turn back the Red Sea. I could take you to the spot where I saw, I saw the Ten Commandments for the first time, that, that, that movie. Uh, you know, and I, I, just, I still remember that, that, that Red Sea just opened. And I'm thinking about the power of that. And not only just, just getting the, the water turned back, but then the, the Bible says they walked over on what? Dry ground. That, that's a miracle in itself right there. And the power of God. How about the power to create? To speak the world into existence. Paul said, Paul's desire was that even though they were a small package, he wanted to be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long-suffering with joy. When I think of patience and long-suffering, I think of that as two ways to say the same thing. It just talks about endurance, continuing on in the faith, in the face of difficulty. But then Paul has to add this other word, with joy. It's one thing to endure, it's one thing to be patient, but to do it with joy? That's what Paul said, that's what Paul required, that's what Paul called for these people, to just keep on keeping on in the faith. Letter C, I see here in our notes, the attitude of Paul's prayer, the attitude of his prayer. Here we see, I think we see in 12 through 14, I think we see the, the, the basic, the, the foundation the overarching framework of Paul's prayer life. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of of sins. Let's talk about this attitude. Three things I see here. First of all, Paul was thankful to the Father. Just like all praise goes to the Father, all thanksgiving goes to the Father. He praised God. He thanked God for what they were doing. Secondly, he was thankful for his grace, for his amazing grace. And number three, he was thankful for his deliverance how he delivers us and gives us freedom. The word deliverance here actually speaks of rescue, to rescue from darkness and to take us into light. Three things that I see here in this idea of deliverance. First is the word illumination. We talked about illumination last week. Let's talk about it a little bit more. It says here, look what he says in verse 13. He has delivered us from the power of darkness. Now, the way he delivered us from the power of darkness is by illumining us. 
letting us see ourselves for what we were as lost people. I tell you, that's a painful experience when God really just kind of pulls back and lets us see ourselves naked and undone before Him. How many of you all ever had your eyes dilated? You know, a lot of us are light sensitive. I am, I am genuinely light sensitive. I'd rather try to eat a box of nails than have my eyes dilated. But the, the light, that bright light, I think sometimes the doctor has fun with this, but anyway, the bright light that they shine in our eye allows him to be able to do the work that he needs to do and to see what he needs to see in our eyes. As painful as that experience is, that's kind of likened to the light that God shines on us as lost people and brings us to the point of our need for salvation. He says he's delivered us from the power of darkness. The idea here is being transported, exchanged, moved from one place to another. You remember in the uh, study of Daniel, we talked a little bit about Antiochus Epiphanes and how he was such a, such a dreaded man. He was such a bad man. But the historians tell us that Antiochus Epiphanes actually transplanted 2,000 people from Babylon to Colossae. And so from the history books of Colossae, they would have known all about what it means to be translated or transported, to be illumined. So the idea here, the painful work. Well, the second thing, that takes us to point B here in salvation. The work of God in salvation. Look what he says here. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us, transported us, translated us, convened us, conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. That speaks of salvation. Several years ago, many years ago now, I was in my uh, first semester at seminary in Fort Worth, Texas. The class was Baptist history. There are probably about 65, 70 guys, men and women in this, uh, in this class. And the teacher at the particular time, on this particular day, was discussing salvation and the salvation views of some of our Baptist historians. And he decided to do something today, or on, that, on this particular day, that uh, was very impactful for me. Here's what he did. He went around the room and looked at each one of us, stood in front of each one of us, stuck his bony finger out in front of each one of us, and said, what comes first, faith or salvation? And we had to answer him audibly. Faith or salvation? Faith or salvation? He went around, asked every one of us that question. Now, if you were in that class, what would you say? What comes first, faith or salvation? That's what almost all of us, except one guy. I think he probably flunked the class, and he knew what the answer was supposed to be. According to what the... And when we got finished by all of us saying faith comes first and then salvation, you would have thought we kicked his favorite dog. I mean, he went into a... He was livid. He said, there's only one man in this whole room that knows how God works in salvation. How can a lost man have faith? Of course, salvation comes first and then faith. Well, my professor was wrong. My professor has, uh, he lost that job and he's lost a couple since then. <laughs> because what my short sighted professor failed to remember is, as our brother Gerald just said, for by grace are we saved through faith. And that not of ourselves, it is a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For I know and tell you, the whole thing is a work of God. Salvation is a gift of God. The grace to believe is a gift of God. The faith to believe is a gift of God. It all comes from God. And my poor little short-sighted professor failed to remember that simple truth of the Word of God. Paul said, to be saved, to be delivered, not only requires illumination, it requires salvation. Paul said he praised God that he has transported us, conveyed us into the kingdom of his 
dear son. Finally, the word redemption. Look what he has here. Verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Three things here you might want to jot down. I don't think they're on your screen. First of all, the bondage. We think about redemption. It is a purchasing us out of bondage. We were in bondage. We were in the slave market of sin. We were sold like slaves to sin as lost people. That was the bondage. The payment, Jesus Christ crucified. That was the payment. The purchase price, his blood. His precious blood. As Paul said to the Corinthians, you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. Jesus Christ bought us and paid for us. Well, Paul praised God for these people. And he prayed to God for these people, for their faithfulness. We've talked about grace a little bit tonight, and God's grace and faith to believe. We often sing that song, God's Amazing Grace. Why is it amazing? Why do we call grace amazing? Well, because it works. That's amazing. Because we had the opportunity to receive it. That's amazing. But it's also amazing because it brings total clarity to the salvation plan of God. Most of us probably have been in some sort of a maze before. A corn maze or a maze of hedges. And a maze like that is just a place of confusion and we're just trying to get out. Just trying to find the way out of here. Well, we also know that we take a word like maze, meaning confusion, turmoil, confusion, disruption. You take a word like that and you put A in front of it, what does it do? It changes its meaning. Almost, in almost all cases, it makes it exactly the opposite meaning. Amazing. God's grace is amazing because it takes all that is confusing in this world and it makes perfect sense that God gives us the grace and the faith to believe He's the one that provides us with that full and complete salvation. This week, I want to encourage you to go out and live in His amazing grace, knowing the clarity that His will and His Word provides. This week, your homework is this. To read verses 1, 13 through 18. It's a little bit of overlap here. We just, we just finished at verse 14. But read verses 13 through 18 and try to find the nine descriptions of Christ in those words. I'll give you a hint. One of them is he is the head of the church. He's the head of the church. That's one of the nine. See if you can find the other eight. Let's pray together. Father, as we come to you right now, I want to thank you so much for our night. I thank you so much, Father, for your amazing grace, for the opportunity we have to know you, have fellowship with you, to walk with you. And Father, I pray in those areas of our life where we're still weak, that you'd be strong. Father, as we walk this life this week, I pray you would just live your life through us, that we might bring glory to you. Father, I pray for those of our class, especially for that one that's just really struggling with some difficulty this week. I pray, God, that you would just be with them in a special way. Father, once again, I pray for our Epaphroses as we seek to send them a note of thanks and praise. I just pray that we'll, you'll give us that freedom and that time to do that. Father, keep us safe as we travel home. Give us a good night of rest and prepare us for tomorrow. For it is in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. God bless you all. See you next time.